Let's pray. Father, we're believing you for your grace, your mercy. We're so grateful to be here this wonderful time that you have ordained for our lives, for our ministry, even the destiny of churches, lives, countries. Lord, we're grateful. We're thankful that we can be involved. Speak to our hearts. Give us direction. Challenge us. God, continue the work. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for his grace. Appreciate the conference. I'm always thankful. I just say thanks again uh, to this local congregation and Pastor Mestis and just inviting us here. And I just love what's happening. Amazing preachers, amazing sermons. I mean, just every single one of them. And I, I, in my mind, I'm imagining it's a buffet. You know what I mean? It, it's a buffet. And over here, and it's like, you know, you go to a buffet and you like to pick what you like. You got your, you know what I mean? You're going to eat this and more of that and less of that. Nah, I don't like that. And, but this, this, this conference, the buffet is like, you start right here. Hmm, there's meat. Mm -hmm, I'll have some of that. Open the next one. Oh, more meat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, more meat. Yeah. And you get down a little further. It's potatoes. More potatoes. <laughs> so all we get here is meat and potatoes. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And that's exactly what we need, and I'm really grateful for that. I'm, I'm going back to my city changed and transformed, and uh, I, the atmosphere, it's more to it than just the preaching, but also just the, the, the dynamics, the air, the fellowship, all of it together, and uh, having a positive impact and uh, helping us. So I'm glad. You can open your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Last Light night, I gave a little testimony, and I finished it off about a young man who, and he, with all sincerity, he wasn't bragging, he wasn't bone, he's 23 years old. Only thing that really got my attention, because I never, I haven't been shocked in a long time. And he was saying that he, like, at 23 years old, and there's 50, he says, I was a fornicator, and there was, you know, at least 50 people. And he explained the number of times. So he had to be at this at a long time. And I said, I, I'm like, I, I've heard a lot of stuff. But that one really got me, you know. I also, in our church, I, it got my attention because of the work that we do. What we're involved in. We have a young man in our church who recently got out of prison. He was doing 25 to life. It was a miracle. And uh, him and his wife, they also had a baby. As soon as he got out, I guess that would happen pretty quick. And uh, the baby, the doctor said they wanted to, to uh, the baby, you know, they did some tests. The baby's, the baby should be aborted. And uh, because of this defect or this defect, you know, said they want to do multitudes of tests. And, and uh, they came to me and were talking about it and trying to figure it out. And it's a tough situation. I'm, I'm letting them make this, this you know, they got to figure out what they want to do. And I'm with them. And we were praying this thing through. Long story short, the miracle of him getting out of jail. Anyway, they had the baby. They said they're going to make the stand. They're not going to have this abortion. And a brand new, healthy, beautiful baby girl was born. Can you say that was beautiful? That just happened. We have, man, we got some people. We got some sinners in our church. I was going to go down the list and name all these things, you know, but. I mean, we really do. We got some people that are pretty jacked up and messed up. And they're in that church because we invited them. And I was thinking about this work that we're involved in as far as preaching and teaching and ministering the gospel. And the title of this sermon is Somebody Has to Go. Because I can't help but think of all the things, all the people that we have in our church and all the, the from the lifestyles of drug dealers and, and uh, drug addicts. And uh, we have, uh, at this time, we have, for whatever reason, a bunch of uh, lesbians coming into our church, you know, and and they're coming, but they're not coming. They're coming because they're looking and they're searching. You know, they're not looking for me to, to just accept them and all. They understand they're wrestling some things through. And it just blows me away that they're in the church. And there's a lot of changed lives in our congregation. A lot of miracles. People are born again. There's a lot of marriages that are healed. A lot of people have their right minds. They've been restored. They got their clothes on. We got hoochies who are no longer hoochies, and, 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 which is a beautiful thing. And... And uh, we got some people who are dealing drugs, and it's interesting, they, they're going, they, they would tithe, you know? <laughs> Don't get me into that. Right? Oh, these, these 
tithing off their drug deals. You know, like I said, I didn't complain. I just, you know, I wasn't even hurry for them to get delivered either. Just keep on, you know, that's just a joke. That's a joke. Come on. Roll with me on that. I don't, you know. What I was really thinking about is that just like all the preaching about what's in us, the seed, the miracle that we are, how God changed our lives as preachers and the anointing that we have. And I just want to say this. If I had not been there, would the same things have happened in these people's lives? If, if, if I had not been there, I always thought that if you plan a church, if, you're, if I come to your city and I would start a church right next to your church. And I don't believe that I would take anything away from you and I don't believe you would take anything away from me. And the reason is because I believe that we are ordained. There are people that God has ordained for us to reach. And, and, and this is the way God planned it. They're going, they're listening to my song. They'll listen to your song. They listen to the gospel according to you. They listen to gospel according to me. And different people would come in. And, and we wouldn't be a competition thing because of God has ordained it to be that way. I like to think that me in the Los Angeles area, that the people that I'm reaching is the people that God wanted me to reach. I am going to preach a certain way. I'm going to say certain things. I have a certain perspective, a certain attitude. I'm going I'm to preach the gospel according to Reggie Green. And there's people that can respond to that. And so I want to say to you, and this whole message has to be that someone has to go. There are places in, that we're supposed to be. There are people that you are supposed to reach. There are cities, there are countries, there's neighborhood, college campuses. Someone has to go to these sinners. And I know I'm preaching to the Marine Corps of evangelists right here and preachers and teachers. I'm preaching to the choir, but this is old school. We go back and, I, and our roots are common. And, and this is something that we that was this is in our DNA. This is what we do. But just a little reminder. I'd like to go with this message. Would you come with me? Romans chapter 10, starting in verse eight. And I do want to say this. When I first heard this message, I read this text or heard this text preached. I was a new convert. I was saved six months. I was in a Prescott conference. And there's, I'm talking about all the heavy hitters from around the world were in this, was in this conference. And I heard this preached. And there's different statistics that was given and and, you know, about these different countries and people were being challenged and tears are in my eyes because it's like I'm saying, why are you begging these people to go? Why are you begging them? I said, I'll go, I'll go. There's tears in my eyes. I'll go. But I was only saved six months, you know, and I didn't know any better. But it's one of the most, uh, uh, it's, it's a, our opportunity to reach people and to minister to people in the call, the responsibility to, go, to, to respond to that call is intense. And if we don't go, there's a lot of people that are not going to hear the gospel. If we don't do what we're supposed to do, if we don't put up with the stuff that we have to put up with uh, and, and sacrifice like we have to and pay the price, there are lots of people who are not going to see the kingdom of heaven if we don't. Brother preached, talked about whining, and we all pay a price. We all go through things, but the price is worth it. It is, it is, it is definitely worth it because of the souls that are being saved. Listen to this. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord, uh, 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 the Lord over all, is rich to all who call upon his name. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this part right here, then, it says, <clears throat> how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those 
who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Can you say amen? Mm, I like Ryan, Ryan, you do got this mic anointed, bro. <laughs> Tears start welling up over simple things like our calling and our purpose, the justification. Uh, and I'm a little extreme, but my, my soul justification for existence. I look at it like that. I know I'm created for relationship with God. But I tell you what, as, as a purpose on earth, there's nothing else I can do but preach. How, how can I, I, after hearing a sermon like, like Ryan, I love that sermon. Uh, Ryan's getting some attention in this conference. I don't know if you mentioned his name a lot. Last year, I said he was old or implied that he was old. And this year, he's being called ugly. And, you know, but the sermon, we you know neither one of them are true. You're under 50 and you're good looking, bro. We love you. We love you. Mm. What a barbaric sermon that he preached. Raw. It's like he took his shoes off. He's up here barefoot and shirt off and just preaching about the raw. Right? You know what I mean? Just totally about having a relationship with God and, and looking at God in his face and being changed by that and the glory of this whole thing. And I believe everything he said was true. But it's not just for us. It, will, it was never, to, never meant to be. How can we look in the face of God and then not reach out? How can we look in the face of God? How can we be changed and transformed? How can we be delivered from our sin? How can we be born again? And how can we, how can we know the truth and then not be willing to make the sacrifice to spread it? That it's like, it's insane. I said, we have so much, so much has been given us. We have to go. Every place, every neighborhood, every country, every place that we possibly can, we have to preach this message. This is why we're here. This is why this conference is here. This is what the Holy Spirit, I believe, is doing. He's preparing us, enabling us, molding us, shaping us, reshaping us, redirecting us, fixing us up, putting the band-aids on, the, 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 the love juice, whatever we need so that we can function and do what we're called to do. Mm. The gospel is haunting. You know, it really does. It's, it's a haunting thing for me to know. I said, I, you know, I said, all the things that God has done in my life and all the things that God has done, you know, you know through my marriage, it's just, it's a haunting thing. I said that it, it moves me. I have to do this. I have to, I'm, I'm compelled. Are you compelled? I am moved. It's like I, I can't rest. And I'm not super spiritual or religious, but I have to figure ways out to reach people. And, and to, you know, like I said, I want the church to grow, not just so my ego can be here. I want, I want, I want more resources. I want, I want more people. Uh, and it's not just for me. It's for the purpose of that, uh, 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 expanding the kingdom. Yeah. It haunts me because of Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our, our Lord. Hebrews 10, 31, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In Revelations 21, 8, it says, but cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murders, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, I, idol worshipers, all the liars, their, their fate is the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One more time. How then shall they call on him and whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who brings glad tidings of good things. This is what we do. This is our DNA. Everyone here, we're on the same page spiritually. Different, you know, we have different backgrounds and, uh, you know, somewhere we're all connected in the past somehow. I was asking Pastor Messes about that, you know, what's his vision for this conference? And, and he was explaining to me, and sure enough, it's happening. But our, our roots are common, extremely common. Our DNA is the same. Doesn't matter if it's reach, doesn't matter if it's new hope, it doesn't matter. It, we're, we're all the same. 
And so we have to do what we're called to do and never lose track. If we're paying a price, if you're sacrificing, and sometimes it looks like, you know, so I understand all the pains. I'm, like I said, I've been pastoring since 1986, and there's others have been pastoring longer than that, but the ups, the downs, the ins and outs. I've been, I've, Christmases have been weird, you know what I mean, when you're pioneering, and, and you know, everybody in your church is celebrating Christmas, and we're sucking suds, and, and like I said, the kids are barely getting anything. I, I know what it's, I, we know. Have people lose people. Give yourself to people. One of the biggest problems I have right now is that I, if I be, I'm a little tired, but I'm making some adjustments. And you know what I'm tired? Because we, we gave ourselves for years. We had a revival. God moved, lost a lot of people. And like I said, me being me, I'm going to keep preaching no matter what, doing what we have to do. And then more people come in. Man. And I got to love them all over. I got to sacrifice all over. I got to follow up on them. Oh, God. And like I said, they come in and they're not clean sinners. They're the kind of sinners I've asked for and prayed for. Los Angeles has some sinners, believe me. And they're sitting in my church and they're believing what I'm saying. And I'm preaching the truth according, you know, the, the, according to the word of God. And, and they're living and they're thriving and they're, and they're working out their trash and getting their stuff together. You know, I said, but to be honest, man, I said, can I do this again? I had to get our, you know, the core of our church and say, hey, it's like we're starting over. So we're going to have to go back to work. I can't, I can't fluff this up. I can't pretty it up. I, I, like I said, this is what we have to do. I'm going to have to make my adjustments in order. Like I said, I'm, I'm 63 years old and, and not like I'm going to retire or anything. But, you know, man, but this is the life that I chose. This is the one that we were called to do. You know, when you ask God to use you, he uses you. That's a fact. We'll suck the very life out of you. <laughs> He'll give you more life. But believe me, it is what we're involved in is no joke. Bro, with me with this. Can you, uh, you know, re- the work of redemption. I like our brother said about pe- us prettying up the gospel. I like to think about the Old Testament and the sacrifice, the whole thing of the priest and the sacrifice and bringing the animals. You know, that was a dirty job. You know, the, I mean, all, imagine all these oxen, sheep, and, you know, the, and they, they stink. There's animal poop all over the place. There's the smell of blood, the smell of smoke, wood. The priests, they weren't these little dainty guys. They couldn't have been. I mean, how much wood does it take to keep a fire burning at an altar? And, and someone had to cut the throats of the animals and let the blood. Who wants to go? But this was the work of salvation, the work of redemption. This is, this is the way God chose it to be for that period of time. And if you wanted to be in relationship, if you wanted to be right with God, this is what you did according to the law. In the New Testament, we pretty up the gospel again. Jesus wasn't born in a manger. It's a stinking barn. We like to use the word manger because it's sweeter and nicer. But you know what? There was goat, oxen, whatever it was, animals in there. And, and there's no place in the end. But you know what? It was a stinky job from the very beginning. The work of redeeming people, working with people, helping people, counseling people. People come to you. They've been molested by their father or their brother or their uncles. Young boys, young girls. Mothers that were drug addicts and then their kids was left at home and now they're saved and trying to get their trash together. The kids are in total rebellion because their mothers ran the streets for years. But now the mother's in their right mind. And then now you got to work with the kids and the sadness and the, and the heartache and the heartbreak of that. We can go on and on and on again. And we are called to preach and minister the only cure that they will absolutely have, the only hope that they have, the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is what we do. Somebody has to go. Anybody can feed the poor. Mm. Anybody can clothe those without any clothes. Anybody, drug addicts, pimps, hustlers, name somebody. Name the worst people you know. They can do that work. 
But the only people that can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ is us. Blood washed, born again believers in Jesus Christ. And so for that reason, we might want to focus on what God has called us to do and not ever let anything else divert us, distract us, tempt us to get off the track. Not money, not honey, not nothing. Mm. We got to do somebody has got to go. There are people in your church right now. And if you wouldn't be there, I don't care if you only got five people. It doesn't matter. Those five would be lost without you. Those 10, those, it doesn't matter. God has us in that place for a reason. We don't always see uh, uh, why we are there. And I can't help but think, my wife and I, we bounced, we did, uh, you don't want to hear all those stories, but different cities, different places. But I tell you what, everywhere we went, people's lives were touched and changed. Everywhere. And it wasn't always glorious, but it was someone's life was always touched. And I'm quite sure those people are happy and those people are, granted, are, are grateful, especially if they're, they made heaven their home. Are you with me? You see, it makes a difference what we do. Somebody has to go. Someone does. And I think the someone is us. And wherever that place is where God would want us to be, this is where we need to be. And we need to be faithful and do what God calls us to do. The second thing I like to look at God always looks for a man. Now, because of Sister Donna, my doctrine, believe is, all, I, she's talked about, she's talking about, <laughs> can I throw this in here? For, I, just, I just have to do this. I come from a fellowship where women did not preach. In fact, you was just supposed to look pretty and be quiet. We ain't having that today, are we? I, I get killed. I'm freshly out of that old fellowship at that time, and I go to a conference. And so there's Pastor Donna. She's, she's going to be speaking. I didn't know. I was just invited to the conference. I went. And uh, so, uh, and I know who she is, and, uh, and I know, you know, but women part preaching. You know, this is, the seeds are in me. I can't help it. It's, the, I didn't, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Greg Johnson and Mike Masson were in there, and I, so they're there, and we're just, we're just freshly out of this old fr- fellowship, and we're, try, we're looking for something new, and, and so she's going to preach, and I look over there at them, and they look at me, and we kind of, <laughs> you know, make a little joke. Yeah. She gets up, begins her sermon with an illustration about conception, and in my mind, I go, just like a woman. <laughs> I'm being honest. Then she began to peel the paint. And she began to lay it down and make it plain. And I remember the sermon very clearly. It was about conception. And, and it, you know, she goes about it any time that there was a problem in the Bible about, uh, about a lack of fruitfulness. It was linked to the woman in the, in the, in the Bible. And, uh, and so it's, the problem is not with God. It's with us. And she went on. And, and, so, and, I, and I felt this place filled with the Holy Ghost. I look over at Pastor Greg and Mike, and we look at each other and go, oh, my God. (laughs) And after that, it's like when it was over, I said, why do we have to go through any? Let's just stop and go home. We've already heard from God. Let's go do what we have to do. Can you say amen? Give the Lord a clap offering for that. I look for that. Mm. God looks for a man. He looks for a woman. Anybody will step up to the plate. We got some sisters in our church, man. I, I get to tell you, Sister Donna, there is no doubt about it that the influence that you have without even knowing me personally, that I, these, these ladies, these young, young women can minister the gospel, and I let them minister the gospel, and I have no problem with it. And my wife, sometimes when I'm preaching, she's up on the platform, and she does her thing and moves in the gifts. And, in fact, some preachers, I ain't going to mention any name, my best friend Dave Tiarina, he, he, don't even, he wants to know when is she going to speak and when I go to preach for him, you know, what? So God looks for a man, looks for a person. Ezekiel 22, verse 29 to 30, it says the people of the land has used oppressions, committed robbery, mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make 
up a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. God found no one. I was looking for someone to preach. I was looking for someone to teach. I was looking for someone to, to, to run a Bible study. I was looking for someone to teach the young kids. I was used, used, looking for someone to, to do an outreach. I was looking for someone to do something because I care about these people. I love these people. I want to reach these people, and I need someone. To, and then he says, but I can't find anybody. Someone's got to go. I have a saying, and I preach this a lot in my church. That God moves when we move. Listen, God moves when we move. He's linked it that way. When things happen and change, it's because a person, a man or a woman, did something. A city is reached because a couple went, a family went, started a church, started a ministry. I, in, my, in my church, I, I, I am actually a pastor to a, a gang. I am their pastor for the last 25 years. You know, there's a funeral. Pastor Green preaches the funeral. Whether they come to my church or not, you know, but some of them I'm connected. Some, some of them are mainly, especially the number one guy used to do the drive-bys and all that. He's living for God, a real estate tycoon now. And, you know, he's like doing good and wife and kids, powerful testimony. Uh, but him and his wife, but all the, it's, it's, it's interesting. If I had not been here, they wouldn't be here. They wouldn't be there. God moves when we move. We've started outreaches and, and high schools and high school campuses and college campuses. And, and why are we doing it? Just because we can. One time we turned a church into a, this is when they're doing, a, what do you call that? Hard, you music people, you know, you know this stuff about the, the hardcore and you, you get the mosh pit and, and you bump, Right. The biggest outreach services I've ever had is when I just moved all the chairs out. Put one hole in the wall. That was only my required. Don't put any holes in the wall. But I didn't even care. People were lined up. I used to have a dream about people lining up to come into my church. It was during those outreaches that they lined up to come into my church. It was so overwhelming, we couldn't even contain it. It happened, if somebody doesn't do it, then it's not going to get done. Somebody's got to go. We move when God moves, or God moves when we move. David and Goliath, old story. Goliath's down there ranting and raving, send me out a man. No man would go until David showed up. And he shut his mouth, chopped off his head. End of story, great victory for the people of Israel. Jonathan and his armor bearer, they're practicing swords and, and talking, you know, tough talk about being the people of God. Jonathan, being the king's son, I'm sit, sick and tired of sitting around waiting for something to happen. Let's go do something. If, God's, if God is for us, we'll live. If not, we're going to die. But we're not going to sit around here and play church. And you know the story how God worked a great victory for them. His, God's method for reaching people has always been people. God's method has always been discipleship. God's method has always been people. In Mark chapter 3, 13, it says, And he went up on the mountain and called to them, called to him those who uh, he himself wanted. And they came to him. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. This was his method always from the beginning was people reaching people. God's done his part. He went to the cross, shed his blood. He says, I'll do my part, and I need you to do your part. Someone has to go. We don't have an option. We don't have a choice. Roll with me with this. 120,000 people in Nineveh. People that are open and ready to receive God's salvation. He needed someone to go, and no and Jonah was the selection. You see, but Jonah, he didn't like them. He hated them because they were sinners. That trips me out when Christians don't like sinners. <laughs> they, they have tattoos <laughs> and piercings, and they drink and they smoke, and they say nasty jokes. 
<laughs> God help us. We get so religious and so cute, and we forgot what we forget what our calling is. Except it's just us, man. We're in trouble. I like you a lot. Mm, but you know, we need some sinners. Freshen up this thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's what I said, Archer. We, we need some sinners, man. Some hardcore ones. Give me some, some give me some good problems. Come on in here. Let me give me some, give God something to do. Woo! How about that? Give the Holy Ghost something to do. He wants to redeem, he wants to restore. Um didn't you come to the altar for the same problem last week? Can I get somebody fresh here to work in their life? I got you covered. You, you one of the 99. Can I get that one? You see, this is where we're at. This is what we have to do. God wants to save these people, but Jonah wouldn't listen. He didn't want 120,000 people. He, it's a God-given opportunity, and Jonah can't even see it. How many opportunities do you and I pass up? I tell you, my church is 99.9% Latino. And it just trips me out everywhere I go. That's the way it works. I don't know if it's Viola. When I was in New York, it was Colombians and Puerto Ricans. <laughs> Bakersfield, Mexican. And then there, you know, and you know what? I don't give... You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about, huh? Yep. I'll, Spanish music, I, I, want that in this, I want that in the song service. I want it. I want, I want this, this. This is who's coming. If, if Chinese people came in, you know what I do? We start singing some Chinese songs. We start working that way. I could care less. Does it make a difference? No, souls. Africa, Puerto Rico, India. The mission is the same. We are called to plunder hell to populate heaven like Reinhard Bunke said. Is that not our mission? Is this not our job? If we just open our eyes and, and look at the opportunities that are around us and before us and, and not be afraid and, and to step out and to roll the dice and take a chance, rub shoulders with people who are not like us, whatever us is. Mm. Somebody has to go. Remember, it's not about you, it's about them. Jonah goes and the whole city repents. Beautiful. What would happen if you took a chance? Roll the dice. Lay a hold of a neighborhood, a place, a school, a city, a country. No telling what would happen. Can you say amen? My last point, I'll shorten this. I'm done. Mm. Jesus said, if I had not come, you would not have known sin. But because I did come, you have no cloak for your sin. That, it's talking about the power of his presence. Part of it anyway. He's there. If I had not come, he says, but now you have no excuse. Well, that's, it just takes a person. A lot of times people don't know. God said the people of Nineveh, they didn't know their left hand for their right. He said, these people are totally jacked up and messed up. Would you go preach Jonah? So the eyes of the Lord go throughout the whole earth, searching for those whose hearts are upright. And the last thing I want to look at, and I'll finish with this. Here I am, send me. Mm. Can, I, can, can we roll this scripture? Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. There's another cheer, cheer jerking. I'm saying it now, so I don't want to be crying over this stuff. Hallelujah. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. <clears throat> and the posts of the door were shaken by, his, by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand 
uh, in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, <clears throat> whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, send me. What a response to an altar call. It is the only correct response to the call of God. Here I am, send me. I'll go. I'll go. I got more, you know, when my wife and I first got sent out, I said we had a 22 foot rider truck from Yuma, Arizona. And all our stuff was in the very front of the truck. One sofa bed and some boxes. Going out, you know, we didn't have nothing. Now, we got stuff. <laughs> Him ain't here got stuff. And I, but you know, I would get rid of all of it. I would sell what I have. I would go. I could do it all over again because of what we're called to do. Stuff means nothing in light of eternity. Houses don't mean nothing. Cars, I like houses. I like cars. But you know what? I could cut it loose and go for broke again at 63 years of age. And I say that with all sincerity because I know I'm talking to veterans here and every one of you old dudes above 50, Ryan, uh, all the old guys, you do it. And they have done it. This, oh, it's the garden to garden theme. I got to slide that in there. That garden, that first garden, nah, I don't really know much about. Try to get some revelations, some truth. <clears throat> All I know is that in spite of what God wanted, Adam did his own thing. Beautiful situation, perfect. Imagine that, in a perfect environment. He's sin-free. He don't have issues. Wasn't raised up in a jacked-up home, messed-up home, or didn't do drugs. Perfect. Perfect environment. Walk with God in the Garden of Eden. Perfect weather. He's butt-naked. Ain't got to put a jacket on, nothing. Beautiful. No shame, no embarrassment. And he still blew it. I say that in light of the times when we jack up and mess up and don't do what God wants us to do and we just blow this. And we are nowhere close to the perfection of Adam. Come on now. First garden. What went down in that second garden was that stuff being redeemed. Being redeemed being turned around for the glory of God. I like to think about it like this, and I've heard different, we all got some different angles on it. But way before Jesus went to the cross, not way, but before he did it physically, he did it spiritually in the garden. It was there that he wrestled out the will of God. It was there, that, like I said, not like he, if, if, if you can take this cup from me, if there's another way to do this, can we, and like I said, whatever it is, you know, but, but you know, can, can we, and it says that he prayed three times, he, he came back, he's, he's aggressive, he's asking in his name. Jesus is asking in his, out of a father-son relationship, and yet the answer is no. And the, you know the story, Jesus, not my will. Your will be done, and the will of the Father was that he would go through this process, and he would do that. And he was, can I, could, would, you, would you believe that he's already, if I said, he's dead in his heart in a good way. He's dead to himself. He's made the choice. You know about vicarious suffering? I'm sure you do. You know, Jesus living in our place, dying in our place. Well, in the garden, he was wrestling the trash through in our place. He was wrestling the obedience. He was wrestling with everything he had to fight with. He's doing this. He's wrestling it through. And the end of that story was he came to the conclusion, not my will, your will be done. And he did that for us. 
so that we can also wrestle this through when we don't want, when we're not feeling like sacrificing again. Like I said, revival again in the midst of our church, you know, and, and like I said, it ain't like the first time. And, and yet only this time I'm older and tired and, and I'm a little different, a little cynical, just a little bit cynical. You know what I mean? A little bit butthurt, uh, a little bit, you know, like I said, hey, you guys, I'm, I'm a preach, do the best you can whatever you need, let me know type thing, you know, no, not, not inviting you over to my house and, and following up on you and making phone calls and sending texts. I'm saying all that because I'm confessing to get that all out because I got to do this stuff. You know, you know the deal. But he rested it all out for me. I can do it again. Jesus did it. Father, it's not my, you know, it's not my prerogative. It's, I don't have this right to just stop doing what you want me to do and go off into the sunset and say, I've already done my part. Lord, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm willing to do. All the way to the very end. Because once we make heaven our home, and all the people that we've reached and we preach to and we minister to, and they're there and they're grateful, they're happy, man, that's the only reward we need. Are you with me? Hey, look, one, one thing. I got an envelope. What is it? I got an offering. Last Tuesday. And it was one of the best offerings that we had in a long time. And, but there was nothing in it. It was an empty envelope. But written on the envelope was, Pastor, I'm going to live for Jesus. No more sin, no more lies. Man. I could do it again. God bless you. That's all I got. <laughs>